We are rolling. When did uh, you first become aware that he was considering appointing you Attorney General? <clears throat> the president liked to, maybe didn't like to, but he did uh, do things that surprised people constantly. And in late September of 66, I remember we were sitting, I was with Nick Katzenbach at the time, we were sitting in a meeting of the uh, Crime Commission, the President's Crime Commission, which is a very important uh, comprehensive analysis of crime in, in America. Extremely helpful. Uh, he did the same thing with riots and, and violence, uh, the Kerner Commission, the Eisenhower Commissions later. And somebody came in and gave Nick Katzenbach a note and he left. So I presided. And when I got out, I was told that um, Nick would be moving immediately to the State Department to be Deputy Secretary of State. And that uh, of course, they didn't have to tell me I'd be acting attorney general. Uh, within a week, or maybe a few days, President Johnson called me over. It showed how, I, I mean, it's hard to believe that many people think of as many things as he does. I mean, he, I often thought perhaps it's because he'd, as majority leader, you'd have to think of what 99 senators' reaction will be, you know. So he immediately his mind would blink, 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 blink on all these things. He called me over and he said, um, said, Ramsey, um, you're acting attorney general. I, I know you have to be thinking um, about and presumably want to be attorney general. And um, I, I, I just need to tell you from the beginning that um, I can't appoint you Attorney General. It was that outright. He said that just, uh, you know, we're, there are lots of problems that we have. Um, there were a lot of problems we're in 1966. We'd had um, race riots and all kinds of problems. The war in Vietnam was reaching a crescendo in uh, public uh, opposition. And he said, there are just too many problems and I just can't do it. He said, uh, I'm criticized for appointing too many people from holdovers from the Kennedy administration. He said, you're from Texas. I just can't have a whole bunch of Texans in here. Um, so, um, you know, I think you've been great and I appreciate what you've done. I know you'll hang in there with me. and but, uh, you can't be you can't be attorney general, so just don't think about it. <clears throat> but that didn't um, that didn't you know terribly surprise me, and it was, I was still pretty young anyway, and uh, I wasn't um, a major public figure at all, and um, I. Um, I think I felt relieved, probably, and it, because it gave me an open field to do what I could in the, in the brief time that I'd be acting Attorney General. We never discussed it again. And then one day in late February of 67, which is a long time, I mean, I'm going from September till uh, late February of the next year as acting Attorney General with um, no Deputy Attorney General because I, I was in, in a sense, I was deputy and acting attorney general at the same time, and uh, other vacancies. And he called me over, no, absolutely no clue uh, about what the purpose was, which, is, I mean, usually they don't send you a message saying, he wants to talk to you about this, that, or the other. He just say like, he needs to talk to you. And uh, I could tell it was formal, cause, or may, I thought maybe he was busy and just had a minute. Because he, he sat at the desk in the, in the uh, Oval Office, and he sat me on the other side of the desk, just the two of us in the room, and I thought, that's the first time we ever sat like this. Usually you're in a corner someplace, or back in one of the rooms where you can be uh, relaxed and he doesn't have his coat on. And he said, um, I've decided to appoint you Attorney General if you'll accept. Will you accept? 
And the first thing that flashed through my mind was, um, what will it mean about my father, who was on the Supreme Court, of course, Associate Justice, since 1949. But I, I said, <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to make a couple of phone calls, but I'll accept. And I was thinking about calling my father in uh, Georgia, my wife. And he said, well, he can do that later. And he punches a button and in comes the press. So he'd, he'd, he'd set the whole thing up and he, he knew or assumed that I would accept her. I think he might have done it even if I didn't <laughs> to put me in a box. Um, and it wasn't the best of all times. I had I had um, I recommended the veto of a D.C. crime bill, which had cost uh, a lot of misery because I thought there were unconstitutional provisions in it. Um, I'd come out against the death penalty um, fiercely, and um, I was um, seen as a principal opponent in the, in the government to wiretapping and uh, excessive uh, police practices. And I bore quite a bit of the brunt of, um, of um, feelings about the riots because I'd been out front at Selma Montgomery. I'd been sent to Watts after the riots and um, he sent me out there to see what happened and what we could do about it. I mean, he was just profoundly concerned about the riots. Anyway, it, um, it went through very quickly. I think, it, I think it was actually the 28th of February that happened, and by March 2nd, Texas Independence Day, I'd been confirmed, so somehow or other he just, he could handle the Senate when, when he needed to. That's the way it happened. Not a, not a, not a dissenting vote in the, in the Senate. I don't know if, how many of them even knew my name, but they, so they knew my name because I'd been around up there on, on voting rights and the Civil Rights Act and others. But um, that, uh, that's the way it worked. My father, before I could call him, announced his retirement. He was, um, let's see, he was 67 years old, which meant that um, by normal standards he would have had 10 more years, say, on the court. In fact, he lived 10 more years and was vital, acting as a federal judge on lower courts. He didn't resign from the court, he, he retired, which meant he couldn't sit on the Supreme Court, but he could sit on any other federal constitutional court. And that part was uh, heartbreaking because his career was the pride of our family. I mean, he'd come out of Texas as from a poor family. I mean, when they were married, they didn't have anything except each other. And uh, my mother and dad well, he, he, he acted like he was a, a kid going on vacation or something, however he felt. And I, yeah, I don't, I've never known. My dad told me that, there, that he had not uh, discussed it with the president, that he had hoped it would happen. We had never discussed it. My father and I had never discussed it. We just didn't talk about things like that. We talked about everything under the sun, but... We never talked about the Supreme Court or his cases, and we never talked about, um, never, uh, because you can't, you know. I mean, you're a lawyer and people think, well, you're in there getting information, you go out and make money or something. And we never talked about my career in the Department of Justice because it's in, it's in half the cases in his court, so you just don't, you, we just didn't do it. That's the way we were built. In, in fact, after, you know, the, the friendship of the families was very strong. Mother and, and Lady Bird, um, they really loved each other. and um, They didn't get to see each other that often in the, in the later years. Dad, once he went on the court, um, it was very hard for him because he's extremely um, sociable type of guy. I mean, he'll talk to people walking down the street. 
It's just he, he loves people. But when he went on the court, not to the degree that some do, but to, to a very high degree, a degree that shocked me, he kind of um, isolated himself, particularly from lawyers in the bar and political figures. I don't, I don't think he um, saw the president um, often. I don't think he saw the vice president often. I don't think he saw the majority leader often because he was on the court during all those years. He would see him on formal occasions, obviously. I mean, the court attends the president's uh, annual White House party for the federal judiciary. He'd see him in the Congress when the court would come to the Congress for State of the Union message or whatever it might be, but you don't really talk. You probably don't even shake hands because there are too many people there. Um, I mean, you shake hands with some, but it depends on whether you just happen to cross paths. Um, President Truman had appointed him. President Truman appointed him in uh, August of 1949. He'd been Attorney General since uh, July the 1st of 45. President Truman changed the cabinet, the Roosevelt cabinet, um, almost immediately. President Roosevelt had died in April, I think it was. And he, he appointed several people before the 4th of July, and four new cabinet officers came in on the 4th of July, or the 1st of July, I'm sorry beginning of the fiscal year at that time in the federal government, um, and Dad was one of those four. Whereas President Johnson maintained um, the same cabinet um, for a long, long time, and some to the very end, of course, Dean Rusk, uh, Orville Freeman, Stuart Udall, perhaps some others. Um, they, they probably met socially, but not uh, at, you know, at, at parties where they would go. But when the president became president or even vice president, he probably didn't go to many. And Dad didn't, they never went on the cocktail circuit after Dad went on the court at all. So it'd have to be some ambassador's party or something like that where you would feel a need to show that our country, our government, its institutions uh, want friendly relations with you. So you go to an ambassador's party. Um, that didn't mean that they didn't exchange um, Christmas cards and little gifts. I think they'd get, I don't remember what he'd send, but sometimes it'd be little uh, packs of tamales. He knew that mother particularly loved tamales. <laughs> uh, they'd come over on Christmas, stuff like that. The, the tamales would, but they, the, the uh, personal contact uh, dropped. It's almost like when you leave the government, uh, if you don't stay in Washington, where lots of people stay, some of the people you've been closest to for a long, long time, you don't see for a long, long time. So I, I, even though you're in the same town, uh, if you're on the court, you just uh, you isolate yourself. That doesn't mean that there was any diminution in their friendship, I think. Uh, I think there was strong respect and strong love, always. It's not that they wouldn't laugh at each other, <laughs> which is sometimes the strongest evidence of a real friendship. You, uh, you dare to laugh at each other. You stayed on until the end of the administration. I stayed on until January the 20th, yeah. I didn't see the president a lot. We had, you know, we had, um, some very important legislation after the Civil Rights Act and after the Voting Rights Act in 65. And President Johnson was keenly uh, committed to it. But the times had changed and it, was very, it had gotten very tough. And um, we sent <clears throat> what became the 60 right, I'm sorry, the 1968 uh, Civil Rights Act, which is, had 10 titles of extreme importance, jury reform, federal jury reform, and state jury reform, and housing, which is the toughest. Uh, the, the toughest place of all to bring people together is in housing. In voting, you know, all you got to do is uh, go down there and vote, and you can stand that. But when you're talking about living in the same housing, same neighborhood and all, then you, you're going from preaching to meddling, as President Johnson used to say. Um, that was all in there. We didn't get um, 
the same sort of uh, participation. We got the we got the bill through the House, as I recall, in '67, maybe in '66, and then the House got upset and said, "We, you know, we passed it twice. They said it hadn't." Uh, talk to the Senate and then come back and see us. <clears throat> in, in 68, uh, it passed. Very valuable and important um, legislation for equality. It was hard to get the president on the phone. It wasn't anything, it wasn't anything personal with me about it. Uh, that's not to say that uh, he wasn't unhappy with me. I don't know. Uh, well, I do know that he was unhappy to some degree, but he never expressed it directly. But <clears throat> it's simply that he was um, consumed with the war in Vietnam. These were the times that he was telling the story about Hardhead, and I think he felt like it had been glorious when you could smash through the line, but uh, he was hitting a brick wall. I remember one incident, I think it was a cabinet, <laughs> when you were, um, you were briefing a cabinet on uh, the conditions and saying, uh, in the federal prisons, do you recall that? They gave a, made, a, made a major briefing uh, mm -hmm. what what was going on in there and how we were, how we were uh, not doing anything to uh, to uh, decrease recidivism and, and uh, we're not doing anything to educate the people in the in the prisons and uh, it was a very passionate uh, mm -hmm. briefing and. He did something that I'd never seen him do before. He got up from his chair and came over where you were standing and shook your hand. Do you remember that? You know, it's amazing. I, I really don't. But um, I know that uh, even if it didn't happen, if I know anything about him and myself, I was very passionate about what we used to call prison reform, which is kind of a misconduct. You can't reform something that's inherently wrong-headed, you know. You've got to build all over start all over. But I know that uh, I felt it was tragic that we were manufacturing crime. More crime comes out of prisons and goes in because the people that go in may have been capable of committing crime, but the people that come out have been further brutalized and are far more capable of committing violence than they were when they came in. And we had to do something about it. <clears throat> and we were trying to, we, we had a moratorium on prison construction. I remember several debates because Senator Hayden, who was very influential with the president. Wanted a little prison in a, in a small town where there'd been an RAF base in Arizona because it'd stimulate and, and the two senators from West Virginia, Robert Byrd and Jennings Randolph, and the president loved Jennings Randolph. Who was a, they wanted a prison at Morgantown. To, and so you're going to bring the kids from the streets of D.C. and Baltimore and the street kids in, in Pittsburgh and put them in in the green hills of Morgantown in a prison. It just doesn't work. Uh, we were opposing it. The president, uh, you know, he was, he would have to discuss it because senators would go to him and say, hey, this guy's trying to prevent us from getting this prison. We want this prison. I was trying to hold back on all prisons. So I know that, <clears throat> but it also coincides completely with his feeling about civil rights because it, he just wanted uh, all human beings to get a decent chance and to be treated equally and he knew that we were grinding up poor people and African Americans and and uh, Mexican Americans in a much higher proportion than others and it, uh, it destroyed their chance and it destroyed their lives and we ought to do better so I can believe it. I wish I remembered it. I wish I had a picture of it. <laughs> Even a mental picture would be nice. The, um, we were sitting at home, George and I, I don't know, <clears throat> well, we knew that he was going to make a radio address when he announced that he wouldn't run again. And um, it was as many other things he said and did, a total surprise. I couldn't, I really couldn't believe it. 
but it it showed that uh, within his personal struggle, the good angels uh, prevailed. I mean, I saw him as a man who wanted um, passionately to lead the country, wanted it as far as I could tell. Because even before I met him, when I was a little kid, <clears throat> the conversations about Lyndon Johnson would uh, relate to or manifest his ambition. He was working <laughs> to get ahead and to do things. And he was working like you don't see people work. <clears throat> and um, here he was in the presidency. He felt the enormity of his desire to create a great society to assure health for everybody, to provide education for everybody, to um, create political equality and um, economic opportunity and uh, justice. And he had accomplished incredible things. I don't think it's possible to make an objective analysis of his presidency without saying that uh, <coughs> On the domestic uh, front, he had accomplished amazing things. It's hard to know who else could have done it, what other type of person could have done it, what other experience and background could have uh, accomplished it. And here he was giving it up. And he was giving it up voluntarily. And he was giving it up um, long before there was any reason to believe that he wouldn't easily be the nominee for a second full term as president, to be president, nominee of the Democratic Party. I don't, I don't think a realistic analysis, doesn't mean that he didn't have some far-sighted analysis. I mean, he, he would see things that I couldn't imagine in terms of the political dynamics in the country. <clears throat> but still, I, I don't, everything I've seen since, too, confirms to me that he would have easily uh, received the nomination. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't have been um, combat and, and uh, hurt and division within the party. But he, I, 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 can, uh, I can find no other possible explanation that he said than that he felt to himself, as much as I want to and believe that I could continue to work toward the great society that we want, I believe that this country will be better served because of the intense emotions about Vietnam, because of the divisions, because of the growing hatred and even violence if I step aside. And if the country stands for anything, it's that we believe in the richness and diversity of our peoples, that uh, no leader can be indispensable in a democratic society, that others have to be able to carry on, or you end. And uh, it, it was, it was a, a historically heroic decision. It must have been extremely painful and must have um, gone against everything he had felt and done for 50 years, <laughs> how long, all of his adult life and most of his youth probably. And he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do for the country. I have, um, I don't have, you, <clears throat> people who were at the White House would know much more than I, and, and others at the Pentagon and elsewhere, but <clears throat> my impression, and it relates to Hardhead not wanting the ball, he knew war, of course, I mean, he, the dominant experience of all of our lives, even I'm considerably younger, have been World War II. And um, 
that came after World War I, which he knew. I'll go back for just a minute to <clears throat> recall how terribly affected he was by mistreatment of Germans out there in the hill country where he was raised during World War I. He lived with these people as a little boy, and they had these hard leather over-the-ankle shoes, and they'd always been kind to him and uh, friendly, and, and all of a sudden uh, there was hatred toward them, and uh, anger and some danger, and he couldn't stand it. And that showed the, you know, the, the strength and generosity of his commitment to equality, you might say. Then when he was a school teacher, and he would talk about it. I mean, during the civil rights days, he'd talk about it. And then this would be a time when he'd, you'd see a tear or two. He went down to Catula to teach. And the, the way I always remember it is, the little children didn't have shoes. They'd come to class, they wouldn't have any shoes. And um, his folks weren't rich, but everybody always had shoes. He didn't, he thought everybody should have shoes and he couldn't understand them. It wasn't right and it hurt him that these children wouldn't have shoes. Couldn't speak English either, lots of problems. Uh, those things uh, affected him. The thing that's, that's puzzled me, you know, is, and I've resolved it in the way I'll describe it, is, is why he couldn't extend and didn't naturally extend um, that compassion, you might say, and that commitment to equality and, the, and that understanding of our common humanity and the desire to see a good life for all to the Vietnamese assuming he didn't, and I have to assume that he was unable to for some reason. Perhaps just freezing it out of his mind, I don't know. But he, um, he desperately wanted to end the war. I know that. He wanted to end it with honor. Peace with honor was one of the main slogans around, and the counter slogan was, uh, peace is honor. But for the President of the United States, I think uh, peace with honor would be essential. Meaning that you couldn't disgrace the country by the means in which you achieve peace. And uh, I think he tried as many ways as he could imagine to work it out. I think in the last months of his administration before the election, he was very concerned that there would be efforts by um, um, the candidates, uh, and particularly by the Republican candidate, to um, negotiate something with, um, with Vietnam to use the war, as he had seen uh, happen in 1952 in the Korean uh, campaign and the, and, and the race in, for presidency in 1953, in 1952. <clears throat> so he, he he couldn't see how to do it. One, uh, but that's what he wanted to do, and he tried to, and he couldn't. He didn't know how to deal with um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff with with the military people. He looked at them, and you could almost tell. He think, well, you know, I'm a country kid from Texas, and here these guys have got all this brass, and they spent all these years at uh, West Point. And, marching around, training with their weapons and everything, and, and um, how do I tell them? Uh, they tell me they can do it, uh, give them a little more time and a few more soldiers, and, and who, how, how, in the countries at stake, you know, how do I, what do I tell them? Uh, I'm, I'm, I think, the only attorney general in our history who was not on the um, National Security Council. And um, it may be simply because, and I don't know, uh, that when Nick went over to, uh, to the State Department, he wanted him to be on the Security Council as well as um, Dean Rusk. And I don't know whether he remained on the Security Council, because presumably he could fill in for Rusk if Rusk wasn't there. But anyway, I know I wasn't put on the Security Council, which um, was a great relief because uh, I was uh, I was opposed to the war and I would have. But what he would do is he would call me over from time to time, <laughs> and 
it was always a tough morning, and he'd have all these guys sitting around this big table, and they'd be having breakfast, and they'd be, the, and they'd be discussing things like the one I particularly remember is whether to bomb above a certain latitude in Vietnam, which later was done with relish by the Nixon administration, Christmas bombing, among others. And you'd hear people say, no, you shouldn't, um, because we need to limit the war, we need to limit the damage, we need to prevent civilian casualties, stuff like that, and because we think international law really doesn't um, permit it unless we uh, uh, declare all-out war, which will Im implicate China and other people can't do it, shouldn't do it. Others would say, you've got to do it. I mean, you're playing a game with American lives because they're infiltrating down from there and they're protected up to they get across the, to get to the line and then you, don't, you can't catch them. They're coming through Cambodia and all this stuff. So we went around the table and around the table. The only reason that he could have brought me there was to get someone to say something uh, in opposition. And uh, I remember I said, and, uh, and they were just kind of a, they were like, where did he come from? I said, you know, I think uh, it's not a question of whether we bomb uh, north of that line or not, or just south. I don't think we ought to be bombing at all. That we're just uh, bombing and bombing, and uh, it gets worse and worse, and we're killing people, and we ought to get out. And I think he wanted that. I think he wanted somebody in there to say that. He didn't want somebody in there all the time who was, you know, like a wooden shoe in machinery, sabotage, as we say. Um, but to me, and it wasn't much fun, and he never commented on it. I mean, he never said, thanks or are you crazy or anything he just uh, but he'd pull me in for that purpose once in a while not many times two or three times I think he wanted um, <clears throat> to find the way out and had decided that he wouldn't be able to that um, someone else might that he'd become the focal point of too much of um, the, the struggle and emotion. And that's uh, when he decided, as he decided all these things uh, after consultation, that uh, he would resign or not run, run again. Well. That's a long, that's long very, statement. Very uh, <coughs> insightful and passionate statement uh, throughout Ramsey, and uh, it's going to be a, a great contribution to the archives. Appreciate uh, you doing it. Well, it's a great archive. It's an important archive, and um, it's a privilege to be able to do it. I appreciate you coming up and taking your time. Okay.